believe in everything Auburn is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online continues to be your number one source for all basketball wagering needs, including pro and college hoops throughout the year. With up to the minute odds, stats, and trends, you can follow your favorite team's path to the playoffs with in game live betting contests and all the best player props. Experience the world's best wagering platform anytime from your desktop or your mobile devices. Head to Bet Online today to become part of the team and remember to use promo code BELIEVE for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. B L E A V, Bet Online. The game starts here. War Eagle, everybody. Welcome in to Believe in Everything Auburn. I'm Taylor Davis. He's Jason Campbell. We're back. Two consecutive episodes, two consecutive weeks. That's been hard-pressed for us to do as of late, but we made it happen. So we welcome you in, everybody. Let's go ahead and get into all of the action that we're going to cover for today. We'll start out with the Super Bowl, the big news, of course. And uh, I'm going to have to say it through my frustration because the Chiefs win again. They've become that team, you know. I think that um, there was an interview that Pat Mahomes did before the game, and he was being asked about if he has embraced the role of the villain. And I hadn't really thought about it, but that is what they've become. And it it kind of comes with the territory. When you consistently win, when facing you becomes predictable, it, it, people no longer like you. People don't want to see you continue to have it. And that's just the nature of sport. You think of the Patriots. You think of Alabama for so many years. It's the Chiefs now. Unless you are a Chiefs fan, you are pulling for whoever the Chiefs are playing against. They have become that team. And I certainly fell into that because I was pulling for the 49ers so hard. They had so many great stories. It just felt like it would be a more meaningful win for them. I mean, who am I to say? But that's just kind of how it felt. But the Chiefs were able to pull it off in overtime, nonetheless, over the 49ers in Las Vegas this past weekend. Let's talk about the game first. I, I want your take on the actual ins and outs of the play because I don't think it was what many people expected. You've got one of the most efficient offenses in the league against the best quarterback in the league, and it took field goals and trick plays for anybody to get points on the board. Was it sloppy offense or lights out defense? Which one did you see more of in this game? I think it's just both teams came out very tense. Um, yeah. When you think about it, you know, you hardly ever see McCaffrey put the football on the ground. And then you see uh, Pacheco does the same okay. thing. He's the driving. And then you kind of see things that it, it seemed like the Chiefs was out of rhythm, you know, just – seeing a lot of uncharacteristic things that have happening where they're arguing with each other. They're, you know, calling uh, pretty much player meetings on the sidelines that yeah. you haven't stopped. And this is all happening in the first half. So it felt like to me that the Chiefs was pressing because mm. they feel like they wanted to defend their dynasty and what they're trying to build. So they was playing not to lose in the first half instead of playing to win the Super Bowl. Right. I think the 49ers, I think Brock Purdy came out steady. I think he came out ready to go. Uh, in that game, they had a great game plan. They were running the football really well, controlling the clock, keeping Patrick Mahomes on the sideline. And the only thing that could beat the 49ers was what? Turnovers. And yeah. that's what them. You know, they had the fumble. And then the one that uh, that set it all apart was special teams because, you know, you block an extra point. Now the Chiefs got a chance to stay in the game because they're kicking field goals to tie the game up instead of having to huge. go for it on the downs. That was a huge block extra point. And then that yeah. punt, punt return – where the ball hit the heel of one of the 49er players and uh, the the ball, they scored a touchdown in the next play. Those two plays right there is a difference in the ball game. That's what right. I say, you, you can play a game the entire game, but it can, it can be two to three plays that can cost you everything. And those two plays right there just stood out the most because nobody talks about special teams. Everyone talks about the offensive defense, but special teams in this game is kind of what derailed the 49ers. Now, yeah. let's give credit too, Taylor, to – Pat Mahomes in that offense. They came out in the second half and they had to convert fourth downs. You know, to win the game, they convert a fourth down. They had to convert third downs, like the the stay keep the ball moving down the field. And they converted on all of those situational, on all the situational plays. And one of my friends is their running back coach, Todd Pinkston. And I asked the game, I said, Todd, I said, I said, man, what was the difference? And he like, Jay, 
all the stuff we work on in training camp under Andy Reid, he puts pressure. He puts these kids, he's guys in the most pressure situations. He goes through every rule. He goes through every every um, scenario. Yeah. And it comes up in the game. We're prepared for those situations, and it is showed in that ball game. And yeah, defense though for for uh, for the Chiefs, bad know he's one. He's the first defense coordinator to win four four championships wow. as a defense coordinator. And rightfully so, man. He I played against him. This guy, he knows how to dial up blitzes. He did he a knows great job. So the Chiefs defense really won this game. I know, the, but Pat Mahomes, those guys had to do what they had to do. They couldn't afford not to mess up a play late in that game. Right. They didn't make the yeah, those those conversions were huge, even into overtime. I mean, the 49ers defense had been so stout. I mean, Nick Bosa was very effective in in handling Pat and affecting Pat, for lack of a better word. Uh, Fred Warner is very intuitive, very instinctual with what they're about to do, where the ball's headed. So I, I want to give a lot of credit to the Niners defense, but right there in ha- halftime, in overtime, you've got a fourth and one, and it ends this thing, and you walk away. And you let it happen. And, and so it's just, this is where it, it comes to some repetition in sports and specifically football because experience will always matter. Experience will always matter. You can bring in these young guys. They can have talent. They can have ability. They can be the most electric guy on the field. But having these teams that have been on a high stage and succeeded, they know exactly what it takes and they know what it feels like to kind of be in a precarious situation on a big stage so it doesn't rattle them. And I'm not saying that the 49ers necessarily looked rattled, but you just knew that the Chiefs were never out of it, even when they looked completely uh, uncharacteristic, because at times they really did. I, even Pat, I was a lot of it seemed out of sync for a little while. You knew it was a matter of time. You knew it was a matter of time before they figured something out, and it likely was going to be some sort of situation between Pat and Travis. They find a way to do it. And Andy as well. Like, Coach Reed's one of the best. Like, they just – they this is what they're built for. And I, I think that it was evident even in this one, and the 49ers certainly have a lot to be proud of. Brock Purdy has a lot – to be proud of. And I know we don't like moral victories in football, but given everything that this kid has had to deal with in terms of naysayers and doubt and all the crap, I think he does a really great job of handling all of it and not playing into it. But what's your take on his situation? Cam Newton actually was in the news a little bit this week because he's been quoted saying like Purdy's not a game changer. Like he can't get these big ones done a game manager can only get you so far. And Takeo Spikes actually did a podcast interview with him and ad- asked him to expound on it a little bit now that this kid is sitting here in the Super Bowl. And yeah. Cam basically said, I'm not taking away from what he is doing, what he has done. My hat's off to him, and I hope he has a successful career. But there's a difference in guys that can change the game and can affect results. I think that Brock Purdy has the makings or do you think he's a guy that's going to have a steady successful career as long as he has really stellar pieces around him like he did this season well a lot of things is when you play in the quarterback position a lot of times you're only as good as your weapons around you right so yeah when you think about, when you think about it you know with patrick mahomes you take kelsey off that team is he's able to be patrick mahomes you know uh, the thing that shows up about patrick mahomes is the way he extend plays, yeah. you know, those are the things that set him apart. Like when he's outside the pocket, he's just as much as dangerous. He's almost outside. more dangerous. Yeah, that people don't realize, like him tucking the ball down and running on that fourth and one call. It was a call to be an RPO. You know, either he's gonna hand it off, or he's gonna pull it and try to throw the flat to Kelsey, or if he can, third option is run. And that yeah. decision just looks so easy for him, you know, because like you said again, he's been in those situations. But it's a difference between game game uh changers it, it definitely is you know you think about mike big back when he played like yeah. the way he could take off that's a game changer baltimore yeah. ravens baltimore ravens wasn't able to capitalize in the afc championship because lamar felt like he needed to stay in the pocket to prove everybody that he can be a pocket passer yeah no 
dude, what's gotten you that made you the MVP and made you the game changer is because of what you were able to do with that extra element is your legs, getting outside the pocket and making things happen. Right. And I think sometimes guys get caught up into the narrative of what people are saying, what they want to see from them instead of them understanding like, man, this is what got you to where you are is you being who you are. So I think for Brock Purdy is he's going to always be a guy that's going to be steady because that's just who he is. Yeah. You know, like he's not going to be a Lamar. He's not going to be a, you know, Mahomes. Uh, a Mahomes. you know, he's not going to be a Josh Allen, you know, and those guys or even a Joe Burrow. Like he has a chance to be more of a Joe Burrow uh, than, than those guys just because Joe, Joe's a game, a game changer, yeah. you know, because like, you know, he makes the big time throws when they got to be there. I think a lot of that is making the throws when it's off schedule. Can you yeah. make the necessary off schedule throw to make the difference in the ball game? Not the ordinary throw, the one that you make if the pocket's sitting pretty. But if it's a big third down, a big fourth down, can you maneuver enough to, without having to worry about your teammates doing it, can you do it enough yourself to be able to extend the play to make that to make those three to four big throws in the game that be like the defense gets to the sideline, be like, we did everything. What right. else we, nothing else we can do. That's, a, that's the difference that separates the guys from what they call game changers. And not necessarily, I don't really like the word game manager because you play in the NFL, it's hard. You know, yeah. it's not like there's nothing there's nothing about it being a game manager. If you're playing in the NFL, you gotta make some throws within a game. Now there's just yeah. certain guys that just are just better at making more plays than others but i don't I, like for brock purdy to be sitting in the position he's sitting in you know you got to take your hat off to him he's the last pick in the draft yeah. you know the he wouldn't even anticipate him being the guy and then yes he's thrust in a situation where there are weapons around him but at the same time that puts more pressure as well for you to have to get your job done yeah. because you know because now everything else is set around you so now you, it's up to you to, to finish it and so I, they didn't lose the game because of him. And, no. you know, so they was actually in the game because of the, the throws and some of the things he was able to do to make happen. So there is a difference in everything, but I don't think people should be knocked because they don't they don't look like this quarterback or that quarterback. And we have a wrong thing about this society of knocking people because they don't look like Tom Brady or they don't 1, look like thousand percent. They didn't make all the other guys think they're they're not good. That's not yeah. true. We're in the National Football League. Like, yes, it's not an easy to get to. Some guys are in the Hall of Fame because they have great coaches that knew how to utilize their talent. Some guys are not in the Hall of Fame or didn't make Pro Bowls because they was in bad situations. Yeah, and didn't have the same type of coaching or didn't have the same type of well-run organization, and they wasn't able to reach their potential. I was like, so yeah. you at that level, Taylor? Taylor, like you just can't like you can't knock people because. Yeah, you can take Bryce Young, put Bryce Young in, in San Francisco. You think Bryce Young had the same year you have the Carolina Panthers? No way. Yeah. And like take Brock Purdy and put Brock Purdy in Carolina. Well, he had the same success he had in San Francisco. No, because why? He doesn't have a Kyle Shanahan one that knows how to dial up play calls. You know, even Mahomes, as great as he is, you think Mahomes can go to Carolina and take that Carolina team to the Super Bowl? <laughs> Like, no, you got to have a Steve Spagnuolo. No, you got to have an Andy yeah. Reid. And Mahomes always allude to those things is people need to start putting Andy Reid in the GOAT conversation for coaching. Oh, yeah. Because this guy knows how to dial it up. Like, the last play to win the game, it wasn't like Mahomes had to do anything miraculous. He just yep. ran the right play. The play was already called. Just give him the ball. Just don't yep. overthrow him, underthrow him. It's wide open. You know, so – a, a lot of things got to fall in place. You got to hit it on the head. Like some guys just fall, find themselves in way better situations than others. That's why I say, look, man, it ain't time for me to knock somebody. I just no. like, you know, you better be fortunate that you were, was able enough to be in the situation that you was in. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And I think with the quarterback quarterback position in particular, mm -hmm. we are always pitting them all against each other. And I don't understand. I realize I just did that by asking you that question, but I, it's just because it's the conversation uh, that it's, everyone's it's, having. It's, 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 but I, I, I hate that because everyone's skill set is different and everyone is playing the same game, but they can do it their way. And specifically as a quarterback, that's going to be on full display. But I think the knock on Brock Purdy is that well, for one, all of these people that are deemed experts didn't see this coming. And so now they're trying to uh, backtrack a little bit and still find negativity to validate the fact that they overlooked this kid because no one likes to be wrong, A. But B, he's not glitzy. And this has become a league of 
the most effective quarterbacks, the ones with all the the hype around them, all the the fandom that has I mean like the I feel like football is at a, its height in popularity. I mean, it's always been popular, but there is this was the highest watched Super Bowl and I know a portion of that is because of a, a relationship which blows my freaking mind. But I do think that the popularity is increasing and you've got social media, you've got, you know, all of these streaming platforms, these these athletes become stars and it is at an all-time high right now and these cool, huh? It's international now. It's international. Right? Like, and these glitzy quarterbacks are drawing a lot of that attention. That's not what this game is about. And it doesn't mean that a quarterback is not great just because he's not glitzy, just because he's not going to sling it on the side under a leg, do a backflip, doesn't mean he's not an efficient quarterback. And I think that Brock is going to be successful. And it may not look w- to have all the bells and whistles that you're going to see from a Lamar, from a Pat, whatever. But he's gotten himself to a Super Bowl in, what, year two in the league by playing the game his way. And so I don't think that we knock anybody, to your point, Uh, who has found that success his way. One thing, Taylor, you can say that give him credit to being able to utilize his skills within an offense where everything is against him because of his height, one. People yep. say he can't throw the throw to the defensive line, so he has to do what? Get rid of the ball early. He has to make timely throws. He has to be really accurate uh, when making these passes because his height, it, because his window of, you know, not being on point is not as big as some other guys, you know, mm-hmm. who can, can who has more of a wingspan. So you have to give him credit, too, to understand, like, hey, I know my strengths, and I got to make my strengths work. And, and I know my what, weaknesses. Right, he knows his weaknesses. So, yeah. That's a big part of it, too, where you have to give him the credit from that standpoint of is he was able to keep this job and stick in it because he uses his strengths to get rid of the ball quick, to make quick decisions, yeah. to keep, the, keep their offense on schedule. Like, those are his strengths. Like, he's not trying to be like some of the other guys that can do different things that are more of dual threat quarterbacks and all that. He knows that's not in his calling card. So and he doesn't have to be. The, that's the thing that separated guy. That's what made Joe Burrow special. That's yeah. what made Brady special. Brady wasn't a dual threat athlete, but he no. knew he had to make his strengths his biggest attributes. Yeah. You know, and sometimes dual threat quarterbacks don't have some of those same strengths as those guys do, you totally. know, because so there's everybody's game is different. And that's why I don't like comparison. Comparison is always it's so true. It's a thief of joy. Like yeah. you couldn't even enjoy the moment because people are trying to rob somebody else of an opportunity because of comparing to one another. And a lot of it happens because of what you see on TV every day. And, you know, everyone's getting judged off their performance night in and night out. And, you know, people has an opinion and strong opinion. And these guys are not able to defend themselves nationally. If they come out and defend themselves and people are going to say, Oh, you, you got soft skin, you know, but you, but you have to sit there and take it where everybody else is getting to have an opinion on your, on your, your performance. Right. um, so a lot of that, you know, these guys have to feather a lot and everything. So I don't, I don't think, um, you know, like I said, there is a difference between game game players and, and, and what you want to say guys that I don't like saying game manager. I just say guys that understand how to keep their offenses on tilt, you know, right. but it, it is a difference. You know, there's a probably seven to 10 point swing. Patrick Mahomes probably put up seven to 10 points in that game just off what Patrick Mahomes can do, yeah. you know? And yeah. Brock Purdy did exactly what he's supposed to do. Now, around him, yes, you have to be more solid at everything else that you do. But they're not asking him to make the same plays that Mahomes have to make. Right. Because they have a strong run game, which is something that Kansas City didn't have. Correct. Correct. I really enjoyed this 49ers team this year. I assume it was incredibly heartbreaking for them. That might be a worse way to go out. Uh, but it's been a really, really fun team to watch and, uh, a lot of good personalities. I hope that a lot of them, uh, are, are maintained and they can kind of continue to build on it. The, another big debate that came out of it was their decision in overtime. And I do want to get your opinion on this because it has been talked about a lot and I honestly still don't really see it, but 
The 49ers, obviously, with the new overtime rules, this was the first Super Bowl with the new overtime rules rather than the coin flip determining who gets, you know, the first possession and if they score, the game is over, which has always made less than zero sense. Uh, Now both teams get an initial possession as it always should have been. But the coin flip is, you know, to decide if you receive and which end zone you're headed to. So the 49ers win the coin toss and opt to receive to start overtime. And to, you know, most humans, the perception is that in an overtime situation, your advantage in winning a coin toss is that you let the other team have to show their cards first. And then your decision making is impacted by what they did first. You know what you have to do to live to see another down or to potentially win the thing. And they opted to receive. And Shanahan was asked about it. And once you get into the third overtime, it would have positioned them to have the ball, which would ultimately uh, return to the initial rules. But the value of getting the ball first is to get in position to have the third possession of overtime where you can win with a field goal and without having to hand the ball back to your opponent. That was his quote <clears throat> you're up against a guy like pat mahomes you're up against a, a football mind like andy reed i'm hard pressed to believe that giving them the psychological advantage of we have four downs every time we hold this thing uh-huh. doesn't impact the result yeah if you read all the things that the players were saying after the game that they didn't know that there was a different overtime rule from regular season to to playoffs and and Kansas City players came out and said we go over these rules yeah how do you not know that yeah we go to rules in training camp we go these rules weekly and when the playoffs start coach goes over the rules for the playoffs and so you know they're saying that they didn't know the rules fully they thought if they received the ball and went down the field and scored a touchdown that the game that they would win if they would win and a lot of people still was confused when Kansas City had the ball and was about to score and the clock was ticking the down. Clock. Everybody, why are not calling timeout? Why are not calling timeout? Because in the playoffs, he just goes to another quarter. In so yeah, yeah, so even if he got stopped before and the clock ran out, it would it would go to the opposite side of the field. Yeah. And it was just kind of, so they would have just picked the ball up, went ninety some yards to the other side, and they would have started another overtime, like a second quarter. So that a lot of people didn't know that. Um, so there are different rules and everything. But that's why it's so important. That's the that's the difference between winning and losing. It's the the little things, the details, uh, things that may sound boring when you're sitting in training camp or you you know you're dog tired, but the coach trying to go over these rules and stuff, and you're just toning it out. Yep. And then it doesn't matter until it what it matters. And in this situation, for that many guys to not know the rules, you know, I mean it wasn't they didn't spend a lot of time detailing the rules. Uh, not, I don't know if they didn't think they would ever get to an overtime game in the playoffs, or but they didn't spend a lot of time understanding those rules. And then you see guys firing at each other, like the offensive linemen, the 49ers, you know, going at each other on Twitter, talking about this guy missed this. Now, you, now, you know, people are trying to defend that who was right and who was wrong. Oh, geez. Not, yeah, you just don't want to ever see that because that can start to derail your whole football team. Yeah. You know, you start pointing fingers. And I didn't like the fact that the players came out and said they didn't know the rules that way because now I you kind of see that you, know, you threw your coach under the bus. So yeah. you basically that coach didn't go over those rules with us like that. When Kansas City said theirs did. Um, but typically tell what happens in those situations in the old school format where you were able to, if you score first game over, yeah, you always wanted to receive the ball. Right. But now with the rules changing ever since that Buffalo and Kansas City game that ended in with Josh Allen and Mahomes a couple of years ago, and, my, and Josh didn't get a chance to possess the ball again, they changed the rule. Yeah. So now they're trying to give you more of a fair opportunity that if you score, you get an opportunity to respond and score. Yeah. And after that, That's how it should score, be. Yeah, after that, the net score wins. Mm-hmm. Now, I can understand Shanahan saying, hey, look, we're going to take the ball first. I feel like we can go score a touchdown. If we score a touchdown, then they have to score a touchdown. But then guess what? They got to kick us back the ball. So now we can go down and kick a field goal and win the game. You know, I can see him saying that. But in this situation, your defense have been on the field. And I guess he feel like his defense has been on the field trying to stop Mahomes in the fourth quarter, and he wanted to give him a break. So it's two things you can look at it from that standpoint. 
to say why he did what he did to take the ball. Hypothetically, you would want going against someone like that to let Kansas City have the ball first. Yeah. So that way, if they score a touchdown or a field goal, now you know, okay, we got to go for it on all fourth downs because we have to score a touchdown. Yeah. You know, so it just it makes your thinking differently how you're going to call the plays going down the field because you know if you need a field goal or you need a touchdown based on what the team. So Kansas City was under no pressure because they say, okay, all we got to do is get a field goal to tie it and the game prolongs. But yeah. we scored touchdown now. It's over. Games. They played more free because yeah. of it. Right. Because of that. So, you know, yeah, hindsight is twenty twenty. but I, I definitely would. I thought the 49ers would have deferred to uh, not receive and let the Chiefs take the first possession. Yeah. I don't even know that it's like a hindsight thing. Like, I even think in these explanations and trying to provide the logic i'm not buying it like I, I i'm not convinced that it wasn't either a mistake or just it was a bad decision well, uh, I would have said well um the, what the receiver was wide open for the touchdown and brock purdy is able to get in the ball but no one blocked chris jones you know and that's what the argument was on twitter where it's the guy blocked who he's supposed to block it's a walk-in touchdown for the 49ers and then it is a touchdown but but you heard the chiefs say even in that though taylor the thing is, had the 49ers still score and kick the extra point, what the Chiefs going to do when they get the ball? They're going to score and go for two. Because Pat yep. Mahomes already said it when they interviewed him about it. said, so what was y'all's strategy if they would have scored and kicked the extra point? Where our strategy was, if we got down there and we scored, was to go for two to win the game. Why? Because if they go for it and score and kick an extra point, and the 49ers get the ball, go down the field, kick a field goal, game's over. 49ers win. So their best chance to know that they have to win the game if the 49ers score was to score and go for two to win the game. That's the difference between knowing the details of the game and, and knowing the rules and regulation. That's why yeah. I say why they're the champs. Yet again, one more quick topic that also sparked some debate, as it always does, the halftime performance. My man, Usher. Yeah. We did get appearances from people that we predicted, as well as some people that I might have slided on the podcast. And I apologize, Will. I am for saying that no one would care. You did a great job, uh, Alicia Keys. Bit of a crack at the beginning, but otherwise did a good job. Uh, Lil John, Luda, her came out on the guitar. Um, give me your thoughts first on halftime. Halftime for me is always fun part of the Super Bowl, along yeah. with commercials. I'm a little bit disappointed in some of the commercials. But Very. the uh, halftime show, Usher hit every generation. You know, he went all the way back to my junior high days. So good. All the way up to now. And the only person he wasn't able to bring out that he asked was Justin Bieber uh, to come out, but he didn't want to come. But he hit every generation. And the fact that, you know, I know a lot of people like to say, oh, it wasn't a top 10 or was it top 15. Man, I thought he gave the crowd in a matter of 20 minutes and how fast you got to do this. And you got that many hit songs and you got to try to make it work. Like, you know, and under that type of pressure, I, I thought he did a really good job because he's about to go on tour. So, mm -hmm. you know, overall, I, I enjoyed the show just because it touched every generation. Good stuff. So here's the thing. Usher's catalog is one of the most impressive for performers <laughs> of our time for real like like you're mentioning yeah. like every generation he has songs that are going to like pass the test of time like i when they started yeah that doona doona at the beginning i literally was like i would bet money your daughter will hear that song in the clubs one day like i guarantee that song will live on burn yeah. confessions those were like i was in like junior high when those came out and it evokes the same response from everyone. Like some artists are just so musically gifted that they don't go out of style. And he is that. He is an incredible dancer. Like just let the man get up there and dance. My only thing that I didn't like about it, kind of what you were saying in 20 minutes, like he gave us a lot. I honestly felt like he did too much. Like the beginning when he was on the field and every performer circus performer in Vegas was on the field and the camera couldn't even like stay with him. It was yeah. just a little chaotic. And I know that the Super Bowl performance is, you know, remember when Lady Gaga like jumped in from the roof, like it's going to be a lot, but there's a difference in like 
organized chaos and just chaos. And his was a little chaotic at times. The roller skates. I think that's like a fun addition. I didn't think Usher needed to be in roller skates. He fell a little bit. And it, it just, you take these risks, you take too many of them, there's a greater chance that it's going to fall apart a little bit. And there were parts of the performance where I was like, dang it, like this is taking away from how talented you are. So that was my only holdback. Well, you couldn't hit some of the, the hit songs longer, you know, just yes. because they put in so many songs. And you know, I know what it's about. You're trying to prepare everyone for your tour. So yeah. you try to remind people some of these songs, but some of the hit a- songs they get right into it, they get out of it so quickly. I you know. Yeah, you know, so but everyone's talking about next year's Super Bowl in New Orleans. And Lewayne has came out and said he wants to be the person to perform at halftime in New Orleans next year. Your thoughts. <laughs> I would pay any amount of money to go. If he, if Wayne is a halftime performer, I'm going. And with that, football season is is in the rearview mirror. Crazy. It uh, there's always so much anticipation, and then you blink and it's over. But now begins our anticipation for the 2024 season, and I look forward to what's to come. Uh, with that though, spring practice for Auburn will begin February 27th. So just a couple weeks away from the guys being back. I know, crazy. Uh, Also, the Combine will be February 26th to March 4th. And a few Auburn guys have officially been invited to that. DJ James, Nehemiah Pritchett, Jalen Simpson, Marcus Harris, and Justin Rogers have all received invitations to go out to the Combine. So hats off to them. I love the draft every year, so we will uh, definitely keep you covered as we lead up to the NFL draft. But before we wrap this one up, we got to talk some basketball because if you are an Auburn fan, you have to be – you better have strong cardiac activity because you could could be a victim of whiplash if you're an Auburn fan. It's just baffling. Two – Two games ago, a week ago, we go out and literally dominate. Look like a dang well-oiled machine putting up 99 points on Alabama. The very next game, we lose to Florida in Gainesville. I get it. I get it. Definitely a tough, tough test. 81 to 65. This team couldn't do anything. It was so sloppy. It was so lethargic. And it is impossible to not bring up the same question that we have asked in seasons prior. Are they a home court team or are they capable of a long run? This may be the week that they have to answer that. Now, both are at home, but you almost have to have these. This is a very, very crucial week for this team. We've got South Carolina at home tonight Kentucky at home on Saturday, college game day will be in attendance. So a lot of hype, a lot of excitement. And the reality is we have an incredible home court advantage. And while that's a huge blessing, it can be your detriment if it becomes something that you rely on too much. And so these road environments are not going to get any easier. We head to Knoxville to face a very talented Tennessee team next week. So to only have those two quad one wins over Ole Miss and Alabama and then have a complete fall apart in Gainesville is worrisome. They can turn it around very quickly as they have before, but what are going to be the keys for that? Because that one was a head scratcher. That's the thing about basketball that I love is that it's not like football. You can you have a bad game. You got to wait seven days before you can play and, and redeem yourself. Basketball, yeah. you can get right on to the next game quickly and have a chance to come out for redemption. I, I think this team, when they went on the road to play against Ole Miss, the first half they didn't show up. The second half they came out like road warriors, and they win that game in Ole Miss. And then you play an Alabama team at home, and you just go lights out, explosive. Yeah. And I wondered that they exert so much energy in those two games that by the time they got to Florida, they kind of overlooked Florida a little bit, thought that they could probably ease into that one and then find their rhythm as the game gets started. But then Florida yeah. came out like hair on fire, you know, shooting the three ball and, and just playing God, with so they much. They were hitting energy. everything. It was almost like they jumped on Auburn so quick before they could blink. It was like, oh, we're in a deep hole, you know, and, and, and it's going to take a lot of effort to try to get out of this and a lot of defense. 
I just think that they ran into a Florida team that got hot. And let's be honest, we didn't we didn't match their intensity when that game started. That's what this team got to learn is when you go on the road to play basketball games, same in football, you got to match the the home team intensity immediately yeah. or otherwise you're going to get run out the gym. Yeah. It's the same thing when teams come to play us at home. They have to match our intensity early. They have a chance in those ball games because they know how effective our crowd noise can get. Totally. So we got to take the same mindset when we go play on the road. These two games that are coming up, to me, are must-win games. And the reason I say must-win games, in order to win the regular season conference SEC, you need to win these two games before you go to Knoxville because that could be the game to determine who is the SEC uh, crown champion of uh, the regular season conference. So I, I, the big game tonight, but this team needs to hang their hat on defense, Taylor, like they always do, and let their offense fall in place. And look, this is going to be as exciting as we want it to be. The fact that you've got a basketball program that has so much riding on it and that the landscape of college basketball is looking to see what you do, that that's a nod in you know, your favor. And clearly it's a, a program headed in the right direction. You just want to make sure that they start to develop that kind of consistency that is going to be required for them to go on a postseason run and make this one different than the past couple have been. A lot of big ones ahead, and uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on all the action. But I think that's going to do it for us this week. Thank you so much for listening, as always, to Believe in Everything Auburn. We greatly appreciate all of our listeners. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. You'll, you'll get a notification every time we release an episode. Make sure you find us on YouTube as well if you prefer to watch. We are on Believe's YouTube channel every week. We'll be back next week to break down all the action. Enjoy the game tonight. War Eagle. Peace. Peace.